Pastor Rick Harrington, I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and the host of Faith in Haverhill. And typically at this point in time, during the show in Faith in Haverhill, we'll have someone in here to be interviewed, uh, a local pastor or maybe a missionary or some type of leader in the community, to talk to them about issues of faith and ethics and current events. Uh, but I wanted to do something a little different for this uh, episode of Faith in Haverhill. I want to do something a little special. My own church, First Baptist Church here in Haverhill, last year, 2015, we celebrated our 250-year anniversary. We were founded in 1765 by a fiery Baptist preacher by the name of Hezekiah Smith. He was a chaplain in the Revolutionary War, and this church has met consistently uh, ever since. Through every war, the Civil War, and both World Wars, and through the Great Depression, uh, and every major event of, of U.S. history, as you can imagine. So we had a great celebration, particularly last October. Uh, we did a special service just commemorating this, had a little bit of, of fun together. And I just wanted to um, basically show that to you. Hopefully it'll be insightful and educating and encouraging to you uh, as you see uh, us celebrating uh, the, what God has done in our church over 250 years. Hope you enjoy it. And um, I would, I am going to be leading the first hymn. And 250 years ago, there would be nothing behind me on the wall. So if you would reach in front of you and grab your hymnal and turn to hymn 111. celebration of 250 years. Uh, for those who may be just joining us, uh, you missed an amazing meal, <laughs> first of all. Uh, but what a blessing it is to gather and to think about how God has been faithful to this church for 250 years. That before this country was a nation, while we were still the colonies, a church was started, a Baptist church was started here in Haverhill, and 250 years later, a, an unbroken line, we still gather to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and try to minister to our city, to our community. And lots has been going on in our community and that I'm so grateful for. Uh, a lot of, of reconstruction downtown, and we hear there's a branch of UMass that's going to be coming in, and we're excited to try to have, expand our college ministry, reaching new people, and excited about all that's going on in Haverhill. And a lot of that has been the work of our mayor, and I'm glad he's here today. So if I can invite Mayor Fiorentini to come up, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Pastor Rick. I'm, I'm so honored to be here, and I'm so sorry about missing the meal. I, you told me 5 o'clock. I got here, and I saw a sign up front, that, which is this, this event here. So I called up, and I said to my wife, oh, I got the time wrong again. <laughs> I blew it. <laughs> and I'm sure I missed a great meal, too. But I want to, yes, <laughs> amen. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on 250 years of serving God and serving your community. What an absolutely astounding contribution. I learned so much of it, but think about that. We go by businesses all the time that'll have a sign up to say, in business since 1968, or 100 years as if that were a record. 250 years is absolutely amazing. And it's amazing to think back 250 years ago what the founders of this church must, must have gone through. And I've been reading up a little bit the charter uh, signed by John Hancock, uh, Booker T. Washington, an early leader of the Negro community, as, as it was called back then, uh, speaking here in the sanctuary on so many different occasions. But, but think of what they must have gone through, not only with the discrimination or the 
uh, let's say, lack of, lack of thrill, but the physical stuff. Back in those days, in 1765, almost everybody was a farmer and had to work all day long from dusk to dawn in very hard work. But they set time aside to come and build your first meeting house in 1765. They must have had an extraordinary devotion to God, to their faith, and to their community in order to be able to do that. I wonder what they would think of us today where so few people attend church, so few people have any time at all for their community. But we salute them 250 years later. And I salute all of you for the great contribution you've made uh, to our community over the 250 years. When I walked in tonight, I felt at home, Pastor Ray. And I felt at home for so many reasons, for all that you and I have talked and all you've done for the community. I felt at home, you're gonna be surprised to hear this, because I attended vacation Bible school here when I was, when I was a kid. So some people uh, might ask, what was a Catholic boy doing coming here? And, and my mother said, you know, the Bible never did anyone any harm, son. <laughs> so I want you to go and learn it and read it, and that's what I did. And every once in a while, I still pick it up today. Not as, not as often as I should, Pastor. But congratulations. It's a great honor to be here. Congratulations on your great accomplishment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, you're always welcome here. I've enjoyed um, bumping into the mayor and having conversations in our local gym, so that's where I, I end up talking to our mayor. We are praying for our, our, the city of Haverhill. We love our, our city and the surrounding towns. We're praying for you in particular, Mr. Mayor, and all of those who are in um, official positions in our city. We wish the best for our city. We're here to help our city. We love, we love our city. Well, uh, so much work, as I said, has gone into uh, the preparations for tonight, not only the meal, but everything that's come together. And uh, that's really been done, done as the work of an anniversary team. And I want to bring up uh, Mary Lou Poirier, who's the head of the anniversary team. And Mary Lou has done, I mean, the whole team has done so much, but I just want to st state about Mary Lou, has done such an incredible job uh, with, with overseeing this whole project. There's no way it would have come to fruition the way it has without Mary Lou. So Mary Lou, could you come up? We have something for you, Mary Lou. So. Are you getting a cutting board too? You don't get the cutting board, you get the flower arrangement, so there you go. <laughs> so much. Um, those are very kind words and um, it was the effort of an entire team and at this time I'd like to call up everyone on the 250th celebration team. Yes, you too Darcy. <laughs> She's shaking her head. Is Dennis here? So I wanted to take a moment and give thanks. Actually, I won't hold it. Thank you, though. I wanted to take a moment and give thanks to those who gave generous contributions toward the meal and others who gave of their time and talent. For those who spent much of the last two days preparing the meal, for those who helped set up, and countless others, um, other ways people assisted this weekend. For our hosts and hostesses, who came early to set tables, beautifully decorated tables that provided a lovely setting for our dinner celebration. We truly could not have done this without you. Thank you. I also want to thank the members of the 250th celebration team and Pastor Rick, who since March have worked closely together on a number of initiatives to make this celebration year special. First and foremost, Pastor Rick, for giving us our focus and our original vision with which everything um, we focused our efforts through. We are so blessed to have you, thank you. For Dennis De Janeiro, for creating that wonderful, I should say crafting that wonderful meal uh, to represent colonial America, no small task. And for his artwork that is part of a commemorative, a commemorative gift that you will receive later this evening, 
Thank you, Donna De Janeiro, equally for, for all your work um, assisting Dennis on that dinner. Beautifully done. Um, for baking all those cupcakes for our kickoff celebration back in May, and for all the ladies who came out on Saturday to assemble them, for all her work on the dinner and the sign-up list, the seating arrangements, the costumes, countless other, other tasks. Donna quietly goes about working tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure everything gets done. Thank you, Darcy Randall, for your work to produce the slideshow that we're going to enjoy in a few moments. Um, the, the, Research that went into this took hours. For your work on the trivia for our Sunday um, and for our Sunday Did You Know series that were posted each week um, in the bulletin and on our websites, for taking the lead on coordinating a game, the game um, for the trivia night back in August. Thank you, Jeannie, as well, for coordinating the ice cream buffet at that event, and Ruthie for running the slides. The night was educational, it was great fun. If you missed it, we're going to have something similar again next year. We had great fun. But Darcy, for all the work you've done on the 250th Kremer Church directory that will be coming out in January, each and every one of you will receive a free copy for that, of that. And again, for countless other tasks, thank you for always being so eager to help wherever necessary. You are the backbone to any, any good organization, any good team. We're thankful to have you too. Brenda. Oh, thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you for sharing with us each week the wealth of knowledge that you have about our rich history and in our Did You Know series. This was not only a great education about our historical significance of the church, but Brenda went on to parallel that significance for us today. It was wonderfully done. Thank you. Thank you for setting up the table displays in the foyer. If some of you haven't seen this, it, you, you need to. If you entered through these doors, or maybe you didn't, if you haven't seen what Brenda did out in the foyer, take a moment before you leave tonight. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you for, um, let's see, I've done that. Let's see. Brenda's also, okay. Brenda has also taken the task of bringing our church history up to date. She's going to be writing our 50 years of history. I think the last one that was done was done... Um, 50 years ago, so that was brought us up to date for the last 200 years. Right. Copies of that work will be available in January, so it gives us something to look forward to. Jeannie Kanovich, thank you for overseeing all the events associated with the celebration, the 250th celebration, make sure everyone is moving forward with regard to tasks and deadlines. As I said earlier, for the work you did to coordinate the ice cream buffet for the trivia night and for taking the lead on coordinating our hostesses and hosts for the celebration dinner, um, you will receive a beautiful commemorative bookmark that she put together um, later this evening as well. Jeannie is so gifted in whatever she does and has wonderful ideas and, and wonderful ideas about how to make an event extra special. Thank you so much. Pam Perone and Darlene Hamstreet uh, were tasked to providing the financial oversight for the 250th and the adherence to that budget. Um, they have done that and much, much, much more, pitching in wherever needed on all fronts. Thank you both. I also want to take a moment to thank Kina. Kina Foreman, are you in the group? Kina, okay. Kina, I know I'm not alone when I say you are so appreciated and so pivotal to everything that goes on in this church. It has been a privilege to work with you. You respond to everyone's needs, all while answering the phone, the door, hundreds of times a day, with a smile, gracious, ass, a gracious attitude. You are the church's interface with the world, and we are blessed to have you. We truly, truly are. For Josh Williams, yeah, I think so. I'm almost done. For Josh Williams, who agreed to let us dress him up on short notice and parade him in front of the church as our town crier, you're a good guy, Charlie Brown, wherever you are. Um, and last but not least, for my husband, David, for Phil Randall, who worked tirelessly on the back room to get this ready for tonight, and countless other tasks on my honey to-do list. We hope you enjoyed this time of fellowship with church family and friends with whom you share something quite special. 
Thank you for being a part of this milestone celebration. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much.
chapter 1. A church was founded in the nation. Transport yourself back into the mid 18th century. Pedestrians strolled and horses the roads of the town of Gable. The promise of opportunity and freedom drew the earliest settlers to the new world. And already now, a few generations had enjoyed the hard earned blessings of their forefathers' sacrifice. The townspeople of Gable, part of the British colony, had little knowledge of the high class workings of Boston and Philadelphia. More important was the coming harvest and the need to store up for the next cold New England winter. Talk of revolution was surely in the air, but it was drowned out by the feel of crackling fire, the smell of fresh bread, and the sound of crickets shrugging. A good night of rest. God would watch over the colonies, kiss your family, work your field and serve your church. Sunday mornings were a time to clean up and put on dress clothes. Risking the Lord's displeasure by disregarding his Sabbath was not to be taken lightly. Most town people would head off to West Parish, a congregation of church. However, some of the town people were growing restless with what they felt to be the impersonal and detached nature of the worship at the time. They secretly longed for a more living religious Experience, something that gave expression to their deeply affectionate feelings for God. Much of this unrest was provoked by the traveling preacher, Reverend Hezekiah Smith. Discontent with established congregationalism, he sought to start a new church in town, a Baptist church. Baptists were not unheard of in Gable, but they were not a common sight either. Most of them had found a home in Rhode Island under the direction of the admirable but controversial leader Roger Williams, a generation or so earlier. But Baptists in Massachusetts and in Haverhill, no less? The thought was too much for many in the town to bear. They refused the use of the parish for meeting, the parish meeting house for the public worship of this new denomination. This did not deter the persistent Smith, as indeed very little could. The Baptist Religious Society of Haverhill held its first meeting January 1st 1765, at the house of James Dunning. Reverend Smith preached from Luke 13, verses 8 and 9, the parable of the fig tree. Quote, and he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The church was started so as to see that, quote, the doctrines of the Bible be faithfully preached and urged upon the minds and hearts to the people. This persistence paid off in time. The first meeting house was raised on June 5th and 6th, 1765, in the heart of the city, due to the generosity of their 52-person church family. The town people remained uneasy about these Baptists, with even some accounts of persecution against them. But they grew more and more comfortable with their presence as each year passed. This was, after all, a new land which cherished religious freedom. The new Baptist congregation continued to meet weekly for worship and prayer. The first baptisms took place down at the wide and gentle flow of the Merrimack River. The church grew quickly in size, and its influence could be felt well beyond Haley. Anticipation of revolution grew until the inevitable happened. In 1776, word spread that the American statesmen had gathered in Philadelphia to declare independence from Great Britain and King George III. The hearts of mothers grew uneasy, even as the minds of young men raced to the prospect of war bravado. It was not long before many citizens and their sons went off to join the American army. However, it fared too much for Smith to enjoy the safety and security of Abel while watching the colony's boys go off to war. He sought permission from the church to join the Revolutionary Army as a chaplain, which they allowed. As an acquaintance of General George Washington, he served for five years and then returned to continue to pastor in 1780. His successor, William Batchelder, would pick up the baton with a heart for Havel and a concern for the new work in global missions. FBC Havel would support the mission of the young Adoniram Judson as he worked tirelessly across the globe in Burma. 
Bradford, the village across the river, knew the appearance of that intelligent and ardent Andover student named Adoniram Jensen, who tramped over the hills to court the Bradford girl. The charming and gifted Anne Hazleton. In 1812, as man and wife, under appointment by the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the Judson sailed for the Orient. It was a daring, pioneer venture of the first American society with the vision of the world to be one for Christ. Presumably every Baptist knows of their change of mind aboard the ship and their baptism by immersion shortly after their arrival in Calcutta. American Baptist missions were born, and Baptists on the Merrimack had a deeply personal interest. Batchelder's interest in the great young foreign missionary movement may be signalized by this fact, that when the Triennial Convention was formed in 1814, for the support of the new missions of the Baptists, Pastor Batchelder persuaded his people on one occasion to send in a gift of $113, not a small sum in those days, from a small town church. The church was now firmly established. It was here to stay in town through winters and warfare with ministry and missions, a Baptist congregation that became mother church to many other local churches in New England, with an influence in Haverhill and the surrounding towns, throughout the colonies and around the world. Chapter 2, A Tale of Two Pastors. First, we have Hezekiah's sin. It is doubtful the First Baptist Church at Haverhill would have been so influential, so quickly, without the extraordinary personality and spiritual gifting of its founding and first pastor, Hezekiah's sin. Quote, in fact, by 1783, the church was the fifth largest Baptist church in New England, having 190 members. F.E.C. Havel's influence was unparalleled in the area, especially for a comparatively small town. Quote, for example, the membership at Havel was 157 in 1778. The First Baptist Church of Boston was the next largest church in the association, having 144 members. No other church had more than 100 members. While this was a demonstration of the power of the gospel, God used the willing vessel Smith to spread the good news to the area. A reformed Baptist with a passion for evangelism, Hezekiah had the unique gift of communicating the gospel to anyone and everyone. He was, he was equally at ease when speaking to an audience of rough backwoodsmen as he was when preaching it to the elite at Savannah or Charleston. In fact, he often used the same sermons. Smith preached the gospel not only to free white men, but, quote, in addition to his regular church engagements, the young pastor often preached to the slaves of his church members. This type of versatility was rare in pastor and surely played into First Baptist founding DNA. Later, the church would find itself in support of the abolitionists. Smith was fearless in his witness. Without this confidence and courage, Smith would most likely have been run out of the congregation with table. As his biographer put it, uninvited and unwelcome. The new Baptist preacher found a group of interested persons in Haverhill and molded them into the first permanent Baptist church of any significance in the area north of Boston. Smith was not afraid of controversy when the gospel was concerned. As in his own words, he often disturbed many of God's enemies and comforted many of God's people. May his tribe continue. Do not let Smith's passion for evangelism lead you to regard him as a theological lightweight. Smith was a very well-educated pastor, receiving a Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton, the College of New Jersey at the time, in 1762, and in 1765, a Master of Arts in addition. He then was awarded an Honorary Master of Arts from Yale College in 1772, another Honorary Master of Arts degree from the College of Rhode Island in 1769, and finally the highest degree in 1797, Doctor of Divinity. Dr. Smith's love for education was lifelong, playing a crucial role in the founding of the University of Rhode Island, now Brown University, and serving as the chairman of the school committee in his section of Haverhill. 
The first written school report in the history of the town was presented by Smith in 1798. First Baptist Church of Paper was well taught and well cared for under his leadership. Smith had a love for the scriptures, preaching through nearly the entire Bible. Quote, obviously well versed in the scriptures, Smith used texts from every book of the Bible except Philemon, with the Psalms, Isaiah, and the Gospel of John each being used on over 400 different occasions. Under this pastoral leadership, the church was active in seeking to guard against sin as, quote, the church discipline was a vital part of the church polity among the Hebrew gods. He remains one of the most underrated early Baptist pastors in America in terms of recognition for his remarkable influence. First Baptist should remain grateful to God for this wonderful servant. Augustus H. Strong. Though his name no longer carries with it the fame that it once did, Augustus H. Strong was an important Baptist figure in the 19th century. He's best known as the president and professor of biblical theology at Rochester Theological Seminary in New York, and as the author of the widely used textbook, Systematic Theology. Every seminary-trained Baptist pastor at the time was reared in the teaching of Strong, and his book remains a classic of Western theology to this day. Many years before his notoriety and presidential service, Reverend Strong cut his teeth in pastoral ministry at First Baptist Church of Haverhill. His pastor came during perhaps our nation's most difficult time, the Civil War. Strong's pastor in Haverhill, though short, would coincide with these very years, 1861 to 1865. Like Hezekiah Smith, Strong watched his young men head off to war but this time against fellow Americans. The need for spiritual guidance and comfort was immense, and his leadership served the First Baptist Church family during perhaps its hardest years. The church also celebrated its centennial anniversary, 100 years worshiping the Lord, serving Him with strong pulpit. This anniversary in 1865 was no doubt a joyous celebration as it coincided with the end of the war but also a reminder of the delicacy and brevity of life. The members left the anniversary celebration, quote, chastened by the thought that long before another century shall terminate, all the participants in the present commemoration will have passed to the retributions of eternity. The year will also be Strong's final year of pastoring in heaven. Augustus Strong went on to pastor another Baptist church in Cleveland, Ohio, for seven years, where one of his members was the oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller, after which Augustus was called to the academic life of theological teaching and writing. Pastor William Fitz followed him at First Baptist Church of Hill, but the church will always be grateful and indebted to the early ministry of A.H. Strong. Strong served First Baptist Church as pastor nearly a century after Hezekiah Smith, but during an equally war-ridden and crucial time, both in American history and FBC Gabriel's development. Chapter 3. The church needs a home. The meeting house. A church is not a building, in the same way that a family is not a home. The early members referred to their church building as a meeting house. However, the family's home often becomes part of their identity in the neighborhood, how they are recognized and remembered. Their design, care, and improvements on their home reveal something about the family. This has certainly been the case for First Baptist Church throughout the years. As mentioned, the church started in the humble beginnings of a Christian home. By June of the same year, the first meeting house was erected. This would not be the only home the church. Indeed, fire and necessity would keep the church moving from place to place within the city. The second meeting house was built November of 1833, when a newly elected Andrew Jackson was president of the United States. The third meeting house was raised on 1849, and then by far the most impressive of meeting houses the fourth and current structure in 1883. The church's fourth building found its home on Main Street and was the product not only of the generosity, hard labor of many members, but of the providence of God. As the pastor oversaw this 
construction said, we all have reason to be grateful to that providence whose eye has overlooked all our work, that no serious accident has occurred to anyone engaged upon its construction. It was a structure built, while certainly ornate, but for the purpose of bringing worship to God through the faithful preaching of his word. Pastor Henry Graves, the pastor who oversaw the construction, wrote, As in the Mount Jehovah and Moses talked together, so in the house of the Lord, God and his people converse with one another. If the service of praise is not a mockery, it is worship. If our prayers are not false to the name, then as we pray, we talk with God. If the reading of the word and its unfolding and application in the sermon be to us what they are in the divine intent, then God speaks in the word and carries his thought to the heart as the gospel sermon is preached. It was a place built for the worship of God and a place where, quote, the stranger will always be welcome. The facility has needed some renovation and repair over the years but have been well maintained so that its original beauty is still a sight to see. It has also expanded in size with a spacious Christian education building added on in the year 1955. This current meeting house has seen much improvement. The sanctuary began major renovation in the fall and winter of 2011 in an attempt to keep its original character while restoring its pristine nature. As a functional worship facility, this renovation culminated in audiovisual updates in 2015. The church's fellowship hall was given a facelift in the spring of 2015, while the church's parking has been nearly done. Additional land was added in 2015 by donation, allowing even more room for future expansion, even in the compact downtown of Haverhill. Chapter 4. The story continues the last five History is a work in progress, and the annals of First Baptist Church are no exception. First Baptist remains an active evangelical congregation serving not only here, but the surrounding towns and communities. It is a church with more than a beautiful downtown location and facility. It is a church passionate about Jesus and seeking to build its ministries around him. I am privileged to be the current pastor of First Baptist Church, following my predecessor, Reverend Dr. Howard Morris, who retired after 28 years of pastoring the church. Beginning a role as covenant pastor in January 2011, then confirmed as the new senior pastor in July of the same year, it is a privilege to serve such an historic and active church. The current staff includes a part-time pastor for worship and care, a full-time administrative assistant, a music director, and a church accountant. Its affiliations are with the Southern Baptist Convention and the American Baptist Churches USA. In 2013, FBC merged with the younger neighboring church, Haverhill Community Church. This was not the first merger in First Baptist history, though the first in decades. The last merger took place in the 1950s with Winter Street Baptist Church, some of whose members were able to witness both mergers. Haverhill Community's members voted unanimously in favor of the merger and graciously donated their building to the now combined ministry of the two congregations. The building on Newcomb Street was sold shortly after to a church in need of a home, Changing Lives Christian Church. This allowed First Baptist to improve its facility and expand its ministries. First Baptist Church of Naval is a church with a big vision, wanting to reach out to our community. Free meals are offered weekly and on Sunday afternoons through our partnership with Open Hearts Ministry. And the ministry of Celebrate Recovery is an active Sunday night event. The church's renewed small group ministry remains a vital part of the church's health and growth, and along with the blended service of worship each Sunday, committed to expository preaching and heartfelt worship, makes for joyful and pleasant spiritual family. As in its early days, First Baptist is still committed to global missions. Much has changed in the world of modern missions, from Batchelder's support of Adoniram Judson to today's diversified efforts at global missions. The church seeks to see the gospel reach the ends of the earth. Plans are currently in the works to send a family with prayers, support, and God's blessing to the country of Nepal to train pastors and strengthen the small but fast-growing Nepalese church. The future looks promising for the very first Baptist church in the city of Nepal, 
that this year celebrates its 250 year anniversary. Some of the original documents and furniture are still in the possession of the church, even as newer computers and sound equipment fill the offices. The same year, the town of Haverhill celebrates its 375 year anniversary as a bustling city. From its active membership, to its committed staff, to its renovated facility, the church is eager to move into the future with excitement. The church remains committed to Orthodox biblical teaching, coupled with a deep, affectionate worship for Jesus, with a mission to reach lost people. We are grateful for what God has done and excited about what God is doing. Yours in Christ, Reverend Richard Hamilton. I just have a brief message uh, this evening, and uh, really I just want to talk about the verse you just saw uh, on the screen, and that is John 3.16. That's a familiar, familiar verse in scripture. You see it at ball games, baseball games, and football games. You see it on billboards as you drive. Uh, Christian families have their kids memorize John 3.16 all the time. It's probably the most quoted verse in the entire Bible. And there's a reason for that. I think John 3.16 really is the heart of the scriptures. It summarizes the whole message of the Bible in one short phrase. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And really, friends, when you think about what that verse is saying, that summary of the Bible, a summary of the gospel, God giving his son for us, that's the message that this church was built on. Uh, 250 years ago, as we talked about, Hezekiah Smith preached the gospel. He preached that very message, and this church was built on that truth. And here we are, 250 years later, and our desire is to be about that same message, to still be those who proclaim and live out the truth of what John 3.16 encapsulates in one verse, that God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I hope that that's the message that we will continue to proclaim, that we will continue to be about for as long as God has us here, for the next 250 years, if that's what God has, or until Jesus should return for us. That's our message. Well, what is the message of John 3.16? For God so loved the world. A lot of people disagree or have a hard time with even that very first phrase. They have trouble believing that God actually does love this world. The world is full of so much suffering, so much difficulty, so much hardship. It's got cancer and grief, and there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of death. And some people want to say, I don't know if really God does love this world, or whether really he really does love me. Maybe there is no God, or if there is a God, maybe he's angry with us, maybe he doesn't care for us, maybe he's abandoned us. But the promise there in Scripture is that God does love the world. Now, how do we know that he loved the world? What's the evidence of that? Well, the verse continues, God so loved the world that... You know, that word so uh, doesn't mean very. I know people use it that way. God so loved the world. Uh, but that's really not the, how the word so is used in the proper English. It's almost always followed by that. What's the evidence of his love for this world? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. If we want to know whether God really does care about this world, whether he really does care about us, there is clear evidence that he does. And that is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. You might ask, well, how is that an act of love? How is it an act of love for God to send his son into this world? Uh, for one, it's a great sacrifice. I have a son and a daughter. I would not give them up for anything in this world, for sure. And I'm sure most, if not all, of our parents here would say the same. But why is the gift of Jesus a great gift for us? Well, because he continues, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, just to be clear, the gift isn't for everyone universally. Uh, he says specifically there is a response, and that response is one of faith. That whoever believes in him, puts their faith in him, puts their trust in him, gives their life over to him, looks to him as Savior, will not perish. Will not become like the animals who die and then are no more. Will not become like a ship on the high seas that's engulfed by the waves and is swallowed up so that it sinks and perishes to the depths of the ocean. No, friends, the one who puts their faith in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. 
When you think about the history of this church over 250 years, so many generations have been part of this church and other godly, Bible-believing evangelical churches around the world who have put their faith in Jesus. And friends, they have not perished. They have not disappeared. But they've been given the gift of eternal life. Everyone from back from the Revolutionary War and the sons that went off to war and died there to those who went off to the Civil War and World War I and World War II and all those who died of all different diseases in all different ways, all the pain and all the suffering that we face in this world which ended in death, none of it could overcome. They have not perished. If they put their faith in Christ, they have eternal life. They're with the Lord even now. Scripture describes it as a great cloud of witnesses that await our return to the Lord as well. Friends, this message, that faith in Jesus Christ is what saves us. Faith in Jesus Christ is what makes it so that we don't perish. Faith in Jesus Christ is what gives us eternal life. This is the message that this church was built on 250 years ago. This is the message that our church is all about right now. This is our main message. We love our city. We care for our city. We want to help all the physical needs of our city. But our greatest desire is for this great spiritual need of a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And this is the message that we hope going into the future, for the next 250 years, or however long it should be, that this church will hold to. That God saves sinners, and he does it through his Son. By faith in him, we will not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you pray with me? Our great and gracious God, thank you for the good news of Jesus. Thank you for a church family that we get to be part of, that has been faithful to this message for 250 years. Oh Lord, this church has seen its ups and downs, it's seen its struggles and difficulties, its hardships, but Lord, it has never left this single message summarized so clearly in John 3.16, but spoken of throughout all of the scriptures, that God loves us enough to give us his son, that by faith in him, we are forgiven of our sins and given the gift of eternal life. Thank you for all who have gone before us. Thank you that they're in your presence, free of all suffering and pain. And Lord, we will one day join with them in rejoicing over our Savior. Continue to bless us. Bless everyone who's come here tonight, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, I thought it appropriate to just Take a few minutes of just quiet reflection. Uh, we're going to have our organist just play a few songs, maybe five to ten minutes of just sitting, listening, praying, and reflecting on the goodness of God. And after which, we're going to bring up Pastor Mike and his team, who will close in a song.
What a great night. I want to thank everyone for coming with a great celebration of God's faithfulness. Grateful to God for what He has done. And excited about what God is doing as we move forward. On your way out in the foyer, there's a gift for you. A uh, beautiful drawing of the church done by one of our own members. Uh, I'll let you guess who. Or you might there might be a signature on it. Nice bookmark and all that. So make sure you grab your gift on the way out. And let's take a minute. Let's end with a benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know we certainly did as a church. Uh, just getting together and celebrating God's faithfulness to us over so many years, 250 years. That's not what a typical Sunday morning uh, worship service looks like, but it was a fun uh, time to spend together. And I'm not sure if you are a person of faith or not, uh, but what this certainly does show is over uh, our country's history, and really over human history, and particularly over the last 2,000 years, um, the Christian faith over the last 2,000 years has played uh, such an important role and has changed so many lives and uh, God has been at work uh, through His Son, Jesus, in so many different ways, in so many different lives. Um, and I can certainly say He has changed my life. Uh, I became a Christian, or, or serious Christian, when I was 14 years of age. Um, and I began uh, going to this church here, First Baptist Church in Haverhill. And most of my Christian life has been spent uh, with this uh, church family. Uh, I, I did have some time out in Chicago going to seminary. That's the place you go uh, to train to be a pastor. Uh, but I love these people. These are, these are my church family. And maybe you are um, a person of faith and you're looking for a, a church home. Um, certainly you've seen many of the, the pastors that we've interviewed uh, in this, on this show, hopefully. And uh, I'm sure any one of them would, would welcome uh, having someone come uh, to their church. And certainly we at First Baptist Church would love to have any visitors. So you're always welcome. Well, I hope you enjoyed it, as I said, and uh, next month we'll probably be back to interviewing other people, other pastors and missionaries and, and leaders uh, in this area. So hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next month. Bye now.